In the computer world, the term network means two or more connected computers that can share resources such as data and applications, office machines, an internet connection, or some combination of these, as shown in figure. Figure shows a really basic network made up of only two host computers connected. They share resources such as file A and even a printer hooked up to one of the hosts. These first, don't stress about the devices labeled hub and switch, these are just connectivity. Devices that allow hosts to physically connect to resources on local area network. These are LANs in their most basic form. Any device that connects to the IT. Local area network can access the resources of the IT local area network, in this case, the servers and printer. There are two problems with this. You must be physically connected to a work group's local area network to get the resources from it. You can't get from one local area network to the other local area network or use its server data and printing resources remotely. This is a typical network issue that's easily resolved by using a cool device called a router to connect the two LANs, as shown in figure. Even though you can use routers for more than just connecting LANs, the router shown in figure is a great solution because the host computers from the sales local Aryan network can get to the resources, server data and printers, of the marketing local Aryan network and vice versa. Now, you might be thinking that we really don't need the router, that we could just physically connect the two work groups with a type of cable that would allow the marketing and sales work groups to hook up somehow. Well, we could do that, but if we did, we would have only one big, cumbersome work group instead of separate work groups for marketing and sales, and that kind of arrangement just isn't practical for today's networks. This is because with smaller, individual yet connected groups, the users on each local Aryan network enjoy much faster response times when accessing resources, and administrative tasks are a lot easier, too. Larger work groups run more slowly because there's a legion of hosts within them that are all trying to get to the same resources simultaneously. So the router shown in figure, which separates the work groups while still allowing access between them, is a really great solution. In a good design that optimizes the network's performance, servers are highly specialized and are there to handle one important labor-intensive job. This is not to say that a single server can't do many jobs, but more often than not, you'll get better performance if you dedicate a server to a single task. Here's a list of common dedicated servers file server, stores and dispenses files mail server the network's post office, handles email functions. Print server, manages printers on the network. Web server, manages web-based activities by running hypertext transfer protocol. HTTP, for storing web content and accessing web pages. Fax server, the memo maker that sends and receives paperless faxes over the network. Application server, manages network applications. Telephony server, handles the call center and call routing and can be thought of as a sophisticated network answering machine. Proxy server, handles tasks in the place of other machines on the network, particularly an internet connection. See how the name of each kind of server indicates what it actually does, how it serves the network. This is an excellent way to remember them. Servers are usually dedicated to doing one specific important thing within the network. Not always, though, sometimes they have more than one job. But whether servers are designated for one job or are network multitaskers, they can maintain the network data integrity by backing up the network software and providing redundant hardware for fault tolerance. And no matter what, they all serve a number of client machines. Back, I showed you an example of two really simple LANs networks. Servers must have considerably superior CPUs hard drive, space, and memory, a lot more than a simple client's capacity, because they serve many client machines and provide any resources they require, because they're so important. You should always put your servers in a very secure area. My company's servers are in a locked server room because not only are they really pricey workhorses, they also store huge amounts of important and sensitive company data so they need to be kept safe from any unauthorized access. Network populated with both workstations and servers. Also, notice that the hosts can access the servers across the network, 
which is pretty much the general idea of having a network in the first place. You probably picked up on the fact that there are more workstations here than servers, right? Think of why that is. If you answered that it's because one server can provide resources to what can sometimes be a huge number of individual users at the same time but workstations don't, you nailed it. With that in mind, you can imagine that one networks are what we use to span large geographic areas and truly go the distance. Like the internet, ones usually employ both routers and public links, so that's generally the criteria used to definite them. Here's a list of some of the important ways that ones are different from LANs. Ones usually need a router port or ports. Ones span larger geographic areas and or can link disparate locations. Ones are usually slower. We can choose when and how long we connect to a one. A local Aryan network is all or nothing. Our workstation is connected to it either permanently or not at all, although most of us have dedicated one links now. Ones can utilize either private or public data transport media such as phone lines. We get the word internet from the term internetwork. An internetwork is a type of local Aryan network and or one that connects a bunch of networks, or intranets. In an internetwork, hosts still use hardware addresses to communicate with other hosts on the local Aryan network. However, they use logical addresses, IP addresses, to communicate with hosts on a different run, other side of the router. And routers are the devices that make this possible. Each connection into a router is a different logical network. Multi protocol label switching. MPLS has become one of the most innovative and flexible networking technologies on the market, and it has some key advantages over other WAN technologies physical layout flexibility, prioritizing of data, redundancy in case of link failure, one to many connection. MPLS is a switching mechanism that imposes labels, numbers, to data and then uses those labels to forward data when it arrives at the MPLS network, as shown in figure. The labels are assigned on the edge of the MPLS network, and forwarding inside the MPLS network, cloud, is done solely based on labels through virtual links instead of physical links. Prioritizing data is a huge advantage. For example, voice data could have priority over basic data based on the labels. And since there are multiple paths for the data to be forwarded through the MPLS cloud, there's even some redundancy provided as well. Network architecture, peer-to-peer -peer or client server. We've developed networking as a way to share resources and information, and how that's achieved directly maps to the particular architecture of the network operating system software. There are two main network types you need to know about, peer-to-peer -peer and client-server. And by the way, it's really tough to tell the difference just by looking at a diagram or even by checking out live video of the network humming along. But the differences between peer-to-peer -peer and client-server architectures are pretty major. They're not just physical, they're logical differences. Peer-to-peer -peer networks computers connected together in peer-to-peer -peer networks do not have any central or special authority, they're all peers, meaning that when it comes to authority, they're all equals. The authority to perform a security check for proper access rights lies with the computer that has the desired resource being requested from it. It also means that the computers coexisting in a peer-to-peer -peer network can be client machines that access resources and server machines and provide those resources to other computers. This actually works pretty well as long as there isn't a huge number of users on the network, if each user backs things up locally, and if your network doesn't require much security. If your network is running Windows, Mac, or Unix in a local run work group, you have a peer-to-peer -peer network. Figure 1.7 gives you a snapshot of a typical peer-to-peer -peer network. Keep in mind that peer-to-peer -peer networks definitely present security-oriented challenges, for instance, just backing up company data can get pretty sketchy. Since it should be clear by now that peer-to-peer -peer networks aren't all sunshine, backing up all your critical data may be tough, but it's vital. Haven't all of us forgotten where we've put an important file? And then there's that glaring security issue to tangle with. Because security is not centrally governed, each and every user has to remember and maintain a list of users and passwords on each and every machine. Worse, some of those all-important passwords for the same users change on different machines, even for accessing different resources. What a mess! 
earlier delineate exactly how data moves through the network. Now, even though these two topologies are usually a lot alike, a particular network can actually have physical and logical topologies that are very different. Basically, what you want to remember is that a network's physical topology gives you the lay of the land and a logical topology shows how a digital signal or data navigates through that layout. Here's a list of the topologies you're most likely to run into these days. Bus, star, ring, mesh, point to point, point to multipoint, hybrid. Bus topology. This type of topology is the most basic one of the bunch, and it really does sort of resemble a bus, but more like one that's been in a wreck. Anyway, the bus topology consists of two distinct and terminated ends, with each of its computers connecting to one unbroken cable running its entire length. Back in the day, we used to attach computers to that main cable with wire taps, but this didn't work all that well so we began using drop cables in their place. If we were dealing with 10 base 2 Ethernet, we would slip a T into the main cable anywhere we wanted to connect a device to it instead of using drop cables. Figure depicts what a typical bus network's physical topology looks like. Even though all the computers on this kind of network see all the data flowing through the cable, only the one computer, which the data is specifically addressed to, actually gets the data. Some of the benefits of using a bus topology are that it's easy to install and it's not very expensive, partly because it doesn't require as much cable as the other types of physical topologies. But it also has some drawbacks, for instance, it's hard to troubleshoot, change, or move, and it really doesn't offer much in the way of fault tolerance because everything is connected to that single cable. This means that any fault in the cable would basically bring the whole network down. By the way, fault tolerance is the capability of a computer or a network system to respond to a condition automatically, often resolving it, which reduces the impact on the system. If fault tolerance measures have been implemented correctly on a network, it's highly unlikely that any of that network's users will know that a problem ever existed at all. Star Topology a star topology is computers are connected to a central point with their own individual cables or wireless connections. You'll often find that central spot inhabited by a device like a hub, a switch, or an access point. Star topology offers a lot of advantages over bus topology, making it more widely used even though it obviously requires more physical media. One of its best features is that because each computer or network segment is connected to the central device individually, if the cable fails, it only brings down the machine or network segment related to the point of failure. This makes the network much more fault tolerant as well as a lot easier to troubleshoot. Another great thing about a star topology is that it's a lot more scalable. All you have to do if you want to add to it is run a new cable and connect to the machine at the core of the star. In figure, you'll find a great example of a typical star topology. And just as with that bike wheel, it's the hub device at the center of a star topology network that can give you the most grief if something goes wrong with it. If that central hub happens to fail, down comes the whole network, so it's a very good thing hubs don't fail often. Just as it is with pretty much everything, a star topology has its pros and cons. But the good news far outweighs the bad, which is why people often opt for star topology. And here's a list of benefits you gain by going with it. New stations can be added or moved easily and quickly. A single cable failure won't bring down the entire network. It's relatively easy to troubleshoot. And here are the disadvantages to using a star topology. The total installation cost can be higher because of the larger number of cables, even though prices are becoming more competitive. It has a single point of failure, the hub or other central device. There are two more sophisticated implementations of a star topology. The first is called a point-to-point -point link, where you have not only the device in the center of the spoke acting as a hub but also the device on the other end, which extends the network. This is still a star-wired topology, but as I'm sure you can imagine, it gives you a lot more scalability. Another refined version is the wireless version, but to understand this variety well, you've got to have a solid grasp of all the capabilities and features of any devices populating the wireless star topology. Access points are pretty much just wireless hubs or switches that behave like their wired counterparts. Basically, 
they create a point-by-point -point connection to endpoints and other wireless access points. Ring Topology In this type of topology, each computer is directly connected to other computers within the same network. Looking at figure, you can see that the network's data flows from computer to computer back to the source, with the network's primary cable forming a ring. The problem is, the ring topology has a lot in common with the bus topology because if you want to add to the network, you have no choice but to break the cable ring, which is likely to bring down the entire network. This is one big reason that ring topology isn't very popular, you just won't run into it a lot as I did in the 1980s and early 1990s. It's also pricey because you need several cables to connect each computer, it's really hard to reconfigure, and as you've probably guessed, it's not fault tolerant. But even with all that being said, if you work at an ISP, you may still find a physical ring topology in use for a technology called Sonnet or some other WAN technology. However, you just won't find any lands in physical rings anymore. Mesh Topology In this type of topology, you'll find that there's a path from every machine to every other one in the network. That's a lot of connections. In fact, the mesh topology wins the prize for most physical connections per device. You won't find it used in LANs very often, if ever, these days, but you will find a modified version of it known as a hybrid mesh used in a restrained manner on WANs, including the Internet. Often, hybrid mesh topology networks will have quite a few connections between certain places to create redundancy, backup, and other types of topologies can sometimes be found in the mix, too, which is another reason it's dubbed hybrid. Just remember that it isn't a full-on mesh topology if there isn't a connection between all devices in the network. And understand that it's fairly complicated. Figure gives you a great picture of just how much only four connections can complicate things. Connections. This means that in a network consisting of only four computers, you have four four to one slash two, or six connections. And if that little network grows to, say, a population of 10 computers, you'll then have a whopping 45 connections to cope with. That's a huge amount of overhead, so only small networks can really use this topology and manage it well. On the bright side, you get a really nice level of fault tolerance, but mesh still isn't used in corporate lands anymore because they were so complicated to manage. A full mesh physical topology is least likely to have a collision which happens when the data from two hosts trying to communicate simultaneously collides and gets lost. This is also the reason you'll usually find the hybrid version in today's ones. In fact, the mesh topology is actually pretty rare now, but it's still used because of the robust fault tolerance it offers. Because you have a multitude of connections, if one goes on the blink, computers and other network devices can simply switch to one of the many redundant connections that are up and running. And clearly, all that cabling in the mesh topology makes it a very pricey implementation. Plus, you can make your network management much less insane than it is with mesh by using what's known as a partial mesh topology solution instead, so why not go that way? You may lose a little fault tolerance, but if you go the partial mesh route, you still get to use the same technology between all the network's devices. Just remember that with partial mesh, not all devices will be interconnected. So it's very important to choose the ones that will be very wisely. Point-to-point -point topology. As its name implies, in a point-to-point -point topology you have a direct connection between two routers or switches, giving you one communication path. The routers in a point-to-point -point topology can be linked by a serial cable, making it a physical network, or if they're located far apart and connected only via a circuit within a frame relay or MPLS network, it's a logical network instead. Figure illustrates three examples of a typical T1, or 1, point-to-point -point connection. What you see here is a lightning bolt and a couple of round things with a bunch of arrows projecting from them, right? Well, the two round things radiating arrows represent our network's two routers, and that lightning bolt represents a one link. These symbols are industry standard, and I'll be using them throughout this book, so it's a good idea to get used to them. Okay. So part 2 of the diagram shows two computers connected by a cable, a point-to-point -point link. By the way, this should remind you of something we just went over. Remember peer-to-peer -peer networks? Good. I hope you also remember that a big drawback to peer-to-peer -to -peer network sharing is that it's not very scalable. 
with this in mind, you probably won't be all that surprised that even if both machines have a wireless point-to-point -point connection, this network still won't be very scalable. You'll usually find point-to-point -point networks within many of today's ones, and as you can see in part 3 of figure, a link from a computer to a hub or switch is also a valid point-to-point -point connection. A common version of this setup consists of a direct wireless link between two wireless bridges that's used to connect computers in two different buildings together. Point-to-multipoint -to topology. Again as the name suggests, a point-to-multipoint -to topology consists of a succession of connections between an interface on one router and multiple destination routers, one point of connection to multiple points of connection. Each of the routers and every one of their interfaces involved in the point-to-multipoint connection are part of the same network. Figure shows a one and demonstrates a point-to-multipoint network. You can clearly see a single, corporate router connecting to multiple branches. You can clearly see that everything gets more and more complex as both the wiring and the connections multiply. For each n locations or hosts, you end up with n n1 slash 2. Corporate Campus Figure shows a point-to-multipoint network hybrid topology. I know I just talked about the hybrid network topology in the section about mesh topology, but I didn't give you a mental picture of it in the form of a figure. I also want to point out that hybrid topology means just that, a combination of two or more types of physical or logical network topologies working together within the same network. Figure depicts a simple hybrid network topology, it shows a RAM switch or hub in a star topology configuration that connects to its hosts via a bus topology. Hub. Topology selection, backbones, and segments Now that you're familiar with many different types of network topologies, you're ready for some tips on selecting the right one for your particular network. Regardless of the type of network you build, you need to start thinking about quality at the bottom and work up. Think of it as if you were at an electronics store buying the cables for your home theater system. You've already spent a bunch of time and money getting the right components to meet your needs. Because you've probably parted with a hefty chunk of change, you might be tempted to cut corners, but why would you stop now and connect all your high-quality devices together with the cable equivalent of twine? No. You're smarter than that you know that picking out the exact cables that will maximize the sound and picture quality of your specific components can also protect them. It's the same thing when you're faced with selecting the physical media for a specific network. You just don't want to cut corners here because this is the backbone of the network and you definitely don't want to be faced with going through the costly pain of replacing this infrastructure once it's been installed. Doing that will cost you a lot more than taking the time to wisely choose the right cables and spending the money it takes to get them in the first place. The network downtime alone can cost a company a bundle. Another reason for choosing the network's physical media well is that it's going to be there for a good 5 to 10 years. This means two things, it better be solid quality, and it better be scalable because that network is going to grow and change over the years. Selecting the right topology as you now know, not only do you have a buffet of network topologies to choose from, but each one also has pros and cons to implementing it. But it really comes down to that well-known adage ask the right questions. First, how much cash do you have? How much fault tolerance and security do you really need? Also, is this network likely to grow like a weed? Will you need to quickly and easily reconfigure it often? In other words, how scalable does your network need to be? For instance, if your challenge is to design a nice, cost-effective solution that involves only a few computers in a room, getting a wireless access point and some wireless network cards is definitely your best way to go because you won't need to part with the cash for a bunch of cabling and it's super easy to set up. Alternatively, if you are faced with coming up with a solid design for a growing company's already large network, you're probably good to go with using a wired star topology because it will nicely allow for future changes. Remember, a star topology really shines when it comes to making additions to the network, moving things around, and making any kind of changes happen quickly, efficiently, and cost-effectively. If, say, you're hired to design a network for an ISP that needs to be up and running 99.9% .9 of the time with no more than 8 hours a year allowed downtime, well, you need Godzilla strength fault tolerance. 
Do you remember which topology gives that up the best your primo solution is to go with either a hybrid or a partial mesh topology? Remember that partial mesh leaves you with a subset of n and 1/2 connections to maintain, a number that could very well blow a big hole in your maintenance budget. Here's a list of things to keep in mind when you're faced with coming up with the right topology for the right network. Cost, ease of installation, ease of maintenance, fault tolerance requirement, security requirement. The network backbone. Today's networks can get pretty complicated, so we need to have a standard way of communicating with each other intelligibly about exactly which part of the network we're referencing. This is the reason we divide networks into different parts called backbones and segments. Figure illustrates a network and shows which part is the backbone and which parts are segments. You can see that the network backbone is actually kind of like our own. It's what all the network segments and servers connect to and what gives the network its structure. As you can imagine, being such an important nerve center, the backbone must use some kind of seriously fast, robust technology, often gigabit Ethernet. And to optimize network performance, its speed and efficiency, it follows that you would want to connect all of the network's servers and segments directly to the network's backbone. Network Segments when we refer to a segment, we can mean any small section of the network that may be connected to, but isn't actually a piece of, the backbone. The network's workstations and servers organized into segments connect to the network backbone, which is the common connecting point for all segments. You can see this by taking another look at figure, which displays four segments. Can a campus area network, CAN, refers to a network that encompasses several buildings. It comprises the part of the network where data, services and connectivity to the outside world is provided to those who work in the corporate office or headquarters. SAN Classic Storage Area Networks SANs, are comprised of high-capacity storage devices that are connected by a high-speed private network, separate from the RAN, using a storage-specific switch. This storage information architecture addresses the collection of data, management of data, and use of data. These networks are typically fiber networks, 